Welcome to Leadership Thoughts Live, Resiliency During Times of Change. I'm Paul Danchek, Director of Executive Education for the University of Southern California's Solar Price School of Public Policy. For those of you who have completed the survey a few weeks ago and or provided feedback to us individually, thanks. Today's continuation of the series is a direct result of that feedback, including on session content, formatting, and timing. Our series continues to have experts in their respective fields share insights on applying their experiences to what it means to be resilient. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Dora Kingsley Pretenton present on resiliency and other political acts. Next week, Larry Kiley is coming back to continue the conversation, this time on readiness plus resilience equals robust. Before introducing Dr. Dora, a few housekeeping items. The session will be recorded and links sent out. Feel free to share the recordings with those within your networks. Enter all questions into the chat box. All participants will be muted for the duration of the lecture, except during the breakout session. The breakout will happen in the second half of the presentation. Many of you are familiar with the process. For those who haven't experienced it, when activated, the screen will shift and Zoom will take you into another room. You don't need to do anything. After the allotted time, it will take you back to the main session. You will work with three or four others in addressing a posed question. We will share a reminder prompt of the question once you're in your rooms. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves. Four different questions will be posed. As a group, decide on one question to answer. After discussing the question, identify one person to enter a response into the chat feature. We'd also like to call on a few people. So if your mics and videos are ready, uh, raise your hand and we'll give you a call. If you have the ability to do so, share both audio and video in the breakout rooms. This helps facilitate the community of learning. Now on to our main event. Being part of USC's faculty since 1996, Dr. Dora Kingsley Pretenton leads the top ranked Masters of Public Administration program for the last 10 years. This is all in the online capacity. She has 20 years training elected officials and senior staff as state constitutional officers and congressional leadership. Her clients carry across 30 states in Washington, DC. She is also a senior political advisor for White House operations in California. To relax, you can find her voting in central Wisconsin. Dora, what's the connection between resiliency and political acts? Thank you, Paul, for having me. I want to thank Dr. Dan Check and his entire team for inviting me today, talking about one of my favorite subjects, political leadership, particularly in a times of crisis. Uh, I just would make one correction that I left the political venue for good uh, 10 years ago when I took on the online teaching uh, program. So uh, I now have the distinct pleasure of training our graduate students uh, and watching all of their fabulous political acts. My agenda today is to go through talking about our current black swan moment, uh, talking about how to define a canary in your own coal mine, thinking about resiliency as itself being a political act. I want to talk about sort of four basic political acts that are important to think about, particularly in times of crisis, and how to build operations and management leadership skills among those um, particular political acts that we can take on as leaders and managers. Um, have a brief breakout discussion to talk about examples in your own life of those items, and then uh, review any references and other Q&A that might be helpful to you. So let me start by just defining a black swan event for any of you who are not familiar with the term. It's one of the things that um, I find very useful to think about events which are typically defined as unpredictable. Now there's a lot of argument in particularly academic circles about whether things like a worldwide pandemic are actually unpredictable. If you listen to Bill Gates, he's been yelling about this for the last five years. And of course, epidemiologists have been talking for decades about needing to prepare for a worldwide pandemic. But for the moment, we'll consider the fact that we were going through our normal daily lives until they were completely upended this spring um, by an event which has widespread ramifications. And of course, after the effect um, has occurred, many people will assert that it was indeed explainable and predictable. In academia, we call that hindsight, hindsight bias. Um, but whether it's predictable or not, it comes at us as a shock. The graphic that you have here on your right shows sort of the relative merit of black swan events going back until the Arab-Israeli oil embargo, which is that circle on the left. Uh, to the right is the COVID pandemic 
compared to a much larger circle, which was the global financial crisis. This is measured from economic terms. So you can see the percentages here are calculated um, based in the economic impact. And the little marker that's going around the outside of the circle talks about how long it took to recover from that black swan event. Um, as you can see from an economic impact, this, the things like that we normally think about as black swan from a political or public administration role such as 9-11, uh, don't show here on this chart of um, major fi global financial crises. But if you think about sort of black swan events in general as a way of framing being prepared for any kind of resiliency in your political career, in your public administration, public sector career, and any of the day-to-day -day volunteer or management functions, um, I often like to think about things that are uh, the canary in your own coal mine. So using the analogy from a, generation, uh, a century ago when they would send, actually send the birds down to see if the toxic gases had built up such that the bird did not survive and neither would the miners. Um, we want to think about looking at the political world around us in terms of what will offer us advance warning of some danger things that might be not re readily evident to us unless we're a really careful observer. Um, how do we identify the anomalies, the oddities, uh, the unexpected things that we think actually have to be integrated into our understanding of the civic landscape? Um, and who in our population is susceptible, as we clearly have seen in the COVID-19 data to date, uh, not all populations are affected by the pandemic in the same magnitude of order or even in the same uh, order of outcomes. And then what do we do in terms of documenting our failures in order to be able to predict the kind of outcomes it's going to take for recovery? Now, some talk about the black swan event uh, in COVID as being technicolor and not a black swan, um, that it is all encompassing, multivariant, and uh, was something that we could easily predict. This morning I participated in a conference call hosted by NASPA and the Batten School of Public Administration at the University of Virginia. They have a pandemic case simulation for students, which is electronic, all of which was based on the 1918 Spanish flu data. And it moved through all of the kind of things they're asking students to consider, um, which are the things that we're living through our day-to-day -day lives in terms of what's in the newspaper. It's possible to make those kinds of calculations yourself, uh, given your own political and uh, public landscape. So I want to ask you here if you would answer a simple poll question for us. In general, what do you use as a canary in the coal mine? What is it that that intangible evidence that you see and collect that gives you an early warning sign and a detection signal that things are not quite working? Is it somebody whose discomfort level or belief system changes among your family and friends? Uh, is it a budget model which has an unexpected outcome or a program or a pattern of behavior that you see at work? Um, that you see something changing, that it's the anomaly that experiences it? Do you monitor the elderly and the disabled and the homeless or the unemployed or underemployed in your own world? Uh, to see what's changing for them to know whether things have functioned or not. Or finally, is it just that intangible sense of plans aren't working out, you're feeling like you're pushing a rock uphill and you're not getting anywhere? What is the one most often um, sense that you use as a, uh, a sense of things might need to be further investigated and, and looked out for? Dora, the results are coming in. We'll just give another second. Seems to be settling down. Looks like the largest category are family, friends, and trusted colleagues at 36%, followed by anomalies and daily work experiences at 33%, when plans don't work out at 30%, and zero for the elderly, disabled, and unemployed. Uh, that's very interesting because that's about split in thirds. Um, even more interesting that we're not actually looking at the populations which are most distressed. And that could be because we don't have as much contact with them or 
we don't think of kind of the public disruption as affecting those uh, at the bottom of the social standing. It's interesting think, results. Thanks, Paul. Okay, I'm trying to switch slides forward. Let's see how I get that done. There we go. Um, I want to talk about resiliency as a political act and um, think about social distancing as a political act. This was a minor debate on Twitter, if you follow the social media, not an original idea of mine. Um, but I think actually one of the most useful ways of thinking about what's been happening in the last couple of months, and more importantly, understanding what's happening in those protests where we see armed folks in front of the Michigan uh, legislature and in Sacramento in front of the state capitol and elsewhere around the country. If you think about the biggest political act that we have seen in largely in a generation since 9-11 as the fact that people actually would stay home. Uh, the governor of um, New York talked about this, Chris, Chris Cuomo, uh, who has been criticized for the length of time it took him to act, but he actually talked about whether the whether when they put in social distancing, stay at home orders, whether the American people would follow that. The fact that people radically altered their lives to both avoid getting sick and to save others, um, I think really should be seen as a political act. And, and more importantly, the argument for the fact that it was political consensus can be seen in the discussions that are mixed and muddled from our political leadership from the city level through the governors to the president about whether or not we should continue social distancing, how much we should social distance once the curve has been flattened, whether the curve is flattened enough to be opened up. Um, but if you think about the ramifications of uh, the collective act of social distancing and stay at home versus the smaller lockdown protests, which are engendered for traditional media attention, and a traditional media event, and therefore they attract a lot of media attention. There's not a lot of easy ways to film people at home. So the only kind of news we've been getting are healthcare workers talking about their experiences. Um, that's, that's really the only way we've been able to sort of project what does it mean to politically support an action. On the right, you see the tracking, the um, flattening the curve, which has been one of the most important um, data visualization that we have had uh, recently for everybody to understand what's happening. There's some really wonderful data visualizations coming out, but uh, the implications of whether or not the American public would stay at home. And then now the fact that we don't have a consensus in political messaging. And so you're seeing widespread divergence in, in what's happening um, on that issue, I think is important for us to understand what's happening now. So I, would like to talk about sort of in the vernacular four lessons that I think are important in terms of this kind of public engagement and democratic behaviors. Uh, the need to build your bank, um, which requires you making deposits into that bank of support before you ever think about taking out withdrawals so that when you come up with a problem like we have today, you actually have in fact uh, enough political support to be able to do what you need to do. I'm going to talk about politics being um, binary choices. Often people will use the shorthand, elections have consequences. We know that that's true, but we also know that much of politics and all of elections are binary choices. I'm going to talk about the opposite of love, which is not hate. Um, and then the fact that bodies in motion tend to stay in motion and how important that is as a political skill today. There's a couple of readings listed here uh, talking about political systems complexity and how to increase and sustain political engagement. Uh, they'll be shown here on the last reference page. So first, building your bank. Um, and whether you're talking about people or resources, um, it's really the same skill set that you want to develop a list of supporters. You want to develop a list of, of people who will follow, right? Um, hopefully before you ever need to, to reach them. And one of the ways we do that is to be um, faithful in our outreach, consistent in our contacts with people, so that we've actually garnered the trust and have an active, you know, it's like any other muscle, have an active engagement with whether that's our political constituency, whether that's the 
um, city folks that we uh, work with, whether that's the community of interest that we're engaged with. Um, and people like to know that you remember who they are and that you've created space for their support to be registered for them to go on deposit um, by keeping records and maintaining that for safekeeping. So I, I find most useful political uh, advice is not in the leadership development piece, but in the fellowship development piece to talk about what does it mean to develop a fellowship. Um, it's easy to be a leader. It's easy to step out in front. Uh, not always easy to be consistent or a good one, but um, much harder, if you will, to develop the kind of supporter that you need that when you need to pivot um, from business to as usual to acts of political resiliency that you have built a group of people who will echo that message, who will come with you on that mission, who will um, make sure that they can help you uh, support your goals and, and activities. And doing that means starting well in advance and providing, if you will, the political chit, right? Doing somebody else the favor, um, doing somebody else the information sharing action, um, giving them or creating a place where people can subscribe, whether that's to your city agency or your political campaign or your other means of working on organizations together, um, where you built your list, where you uh, have them on record and where you have a group of people that you can reach back and touch when you actually need them. I think about leadership in terms of crises based on a unique role that public servants play. And in this case, I think of public servants both as the elected official and as the civil servant uh, and all of those of us who are involved in civic endeavors or nonprofit organizations where we're volunteering. And as I've said, we talk about elections having binary choices, but often those of us who are working within those constraints are working with elected officials um, who came with a particular set of policies or who have pursued a particular set of policies. And in that respect, we are limited in our ability to move outside that um, perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't wanna get things done, but it does mean that you need to be careful to understand the programs and the people um, which are available to you so that when you do hit the moment of crisis as an opportunity, you can really help pivot your perspective um, quickly and live within that framework that has been established by what we consider a, a public democracy and a representative democracy in decision making. I would argue that the need to be creative uh, in terms of being able to make decisions and manage towards a future vision is is important, particularly in these kinds of times of crisis, that the leaders who move along a particular pattern, which was preset, which presumes that business as usual is going on, doesn't acknowledge the sense of urgency that your constituents uh, or the people that you serve necessarily uh, need you to feel. One of my favorite visualizations is this one down on the right um, where the leader is actually putting his hand in to stop the dominoes effect. Now we can't always do that and the growing numbers even today where we saw another 3 million people join the roles of unemployment, those may, things may actually be beyond our capability, but that doesn't mean that we can't manage towards a future vision within our constraints um, of an elected or representative government. So again, uh, readers, readings here on what you need to know about fellowship, but also leadership in times of crisis. Um, it's the ability to, like Freud, uh, Jung and Carl Jung said, really it's our reactions to a situation that people judge us by and not the, um, the sense of the going along and getting along. I wanna make a point here about um, particularly in a highly polarized environment, and I don't need to discuss that because you all live it with me every day. Um, it's really not the love-hate piece, it's the indifference that makes a huge uh, difference. And so people judge indifference when they don't hear you speaking to their language or your employees think that your actions are diametrically opposed to what you're saying. Um, or someone has failed to take action. Um, and so I wanna clearly 
pose to you that um, it's the indifference that will kill us, right? It's the fact that the leader shows no empathy and there are no consequences for action. Um, the ones who have been successful make decisions. They may not make the right decision. That may only be a predicate to making a different decision. But the ability to change production, and that's true even when we're doing management or public services, from sort of the widget making, which is my shorthand for the normal things we go about to do, to focusing on what's wanted and what's needed in goals and services, goods and services, um, is really critical. And in this kind of crisis space, you actually have the opportunity to revitalize those project management skills that many of us used when we were younger um, and sometimes have forgotten now that we're older um, and leading larger organizations. Uh, the critical part here, particularly in a crisis, if you saw on the first slide, we were talking about the global um, crisis in um, economic meltdown in 2008, that took over a thousand days to recover the market, which is about three years. The um, Israeli Arab oil embargo, which was the one on the left-hand side, took nearly 1,500 days to get over that. So these are long-term recoveries. We're going to experience a long-term recovery from this current black swan. Um, but the critical function of not losing your energy and not giving up and moving forward, because the ultimate outcome is going to be determined by those who have the tenacity to stay with the program. Um, and those leaders who find it too hard to roll that, that rock up the hill and lose steam are going to not be able to accomplish nearly as much as for those who just have the tenacity day in and day out, whether you're successful or not, to keep going on a new vision. And finally, this gets me to the fourth issue about bodies in motion. Uh, the chart here is from uh, a leadership manual I have cited that talks about principles of responsible leadership. But in terms of the political resiliency and the way to stay in a crisis, you want to draw upon your preparation, right? We've all had experiences in our personal life, in our volunteer work, um, in your day job, in the last day jobs you've had for any number of years. Um, and many of us forget those sort of small lessons that we learned. And so this is the time to go back to that root experience and think about um, the staff person that you once were, um, the new employee that you once were, uh, the people who first have entered the political arena or public service. Um, and think about the way that they and you back in the day came to this uh, this role and the questions and the scariness and the reassurance that you know all of us exhibited. Um, we don't all have the answers and I think one of the things graduate school does best for us, our students at USC, is to teach them to ask a lot of the good questions. If there's one thing our graduates tell me they learned at USC is how to ask questions. Um, but in a crisis it really allows you to think about what are the gaps in service? What are the ravages to the system um, that has happened here now? And where are we failing in our delivery technologies? Not just the digital technologies, but failing in the delivery of those services and political supports and management techniques that really make a difference to your agencies and to your organizations. Obviously, the 80-20 rule applies. You've, if you're asking others to help, you will get 80% of the help from 20% of the people that you ask. That rule hasn't changed much, whether it's political fundraising or asking for support or even finding uh, quality help in your own organization. Um, but knowing that there's an 80-20 rule in life, that means that you have to ask just that many more people to come along with you on your journey uh, to find the ones who are above uh, who are willing to go above and that always won't always be the people you think it is it won't always be your teammates it won't always be your staff uh, it may be somebody from the outside it may be a partnership organization it may be one of those friends and family members who was helpful to you in that canary in the coal mine um, and again don't let the doubt slow you down as a leader um, people look to us to uh, be able to reassure them that doesn't mean that you have to be perfect or un not scared yourself um, I find one of the most effective tools I've 
used in politics and I use in my teaching uh, is the fact that when a student comes to me and has a, a horror story, as um, many of them have experienced COVID during the last semester, somebody who got sick, the infant was in the hospital with a fever, spouses have lost their jobs, they're working on the front lines. Um, it's very helpful for them, for me to tell a story about when I experienced something that was um, near to that experience and share that vulnerability with them, talk about, I didn't always have the way out, but they clearly know that I've survived and grown older. Um, and no matter what doubt I had in, in the sustainability of our own program, that ability to not stand still and see this as an opportunity to do something different and outside the box, because that's what a crisis will allow us to do. It'll allow us to say, you know, this idea got shot down by leadership multiple times, but now things have changed. And we need not to be hidebound by policies or even discussions and priorities which were made three or four months ago because the world has changed and people are willing to take on a new approach. And so if you're willing to identify the gaps um, for your organization or the goals that you want to achieve and then build a community based on the support that you have and move those forward, this is a super time to get something done that you might not otherwise been able to achieve. For our breakout session today, I asked these questions, um, one of each from the points that I've made. Um, and I, what I'd like to do, or maybe Paul, you'd like to describe these. Um, I'm really looking for discussion samples that we can go through in more detail of a strategy that you've seen used or you've used to build political capital in advance of ever thinking that you're going to need those community supports. Um, I'd like to talk about ways that you've changed your public role to pivot on the focus for your organization during this time of crisis. Any new actions that you've initiated or revitalized, um, which will energize your team or your organization or your constituents. And then what gap uh, has been exposed and who might you ask to help move you forward? Um, and with a few examples, maybe we can come up with some commonalities in terms of operational steps. Paul? Great, thanks Dora. Uh, Daniels could break us up into groups of four or five, uh, depending on how many people we have. And when we come back, just focus on one. We'll ask you to put in a couple of thoughts into the chat feature that we could share with the larger group. So identify one person from your group to be able to do that. And we'll come back in about seven to 10 minutes. And we'll see you then. Great. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for reporting back on your group about not talking about one question in particular, but really talking about the idea of relationships and trust. I mean, we're talking about how you do this in work uh, when not necessarily in positions for uh, decision-making authority. Okay, other groups, if you could chime in. Dora, I think we have a quiet group today. We do have a quiet group today. Shall I just share my screen? There's the questions. So let's talk about the first one about strategies to build political capital. Um, Jennifer, I know you said that many, many of us are not in key roles of decision makers, and that's certainly true for me. Uh, I am in a, you know, in a hierarchical, hierarchical organization. Um, Nevertheless, strategies to build political capital, even at, you know, at my level are important. Um, anybody have specific suggestions they can put in the chat box or strategies that they've seen used um, for how to build community supports? Yeah, there's at least a couple coming in, we talked about um, change and resiliency. I don't think that's necessarily answering your question number one. Uh, but engaging with our board of supervisors, both one-on-one -on -one and attending board of supervisor meetings, being visible that way. Yeah. I think about things like um, alumni networks. So reaching back to people who have had your job previously, um, people who have retired out of your community uh, recently or long-term. Um, the idea of having either a mentor or a sponsor 
I am, I'm sort of intrigued by this idea of not finding a mentor, but finding a sponsor, somebody who helps you get something done. Um, in our case, we've been talking about building a blog so that we had a voice um, to share our concerns, to provide access to students, and more importantly, particularly on the online world, uh, to build a community of of supporters for the online movement within faculty who have not taught remotely or taught on campus. Um, in my political world, it means um, it has meant in the past building databases of people who want to work on specific kind of uh, community activities. So I think building political capital really means establishing a network and doing that with some kind of intention. Are there any examples like that, Paul, in the chat box? Yeah, so the alumni community resonated. Uh, Dora, when you're giving the, when you're describing this earlier, what was really sticking with me was thinking about the whole idea of digging your well before you're thirsty. Um, so, you know, while times of crisis happens and we need to be resilient, um, I was thinking about, you know, what are those things that you're doing that you don't necessarily know where they're going, right? And being comfortable with just building the network because it's part of the goodwill efforts or as part of, um, who you are as individuals to be able to reach out in those capacities. I'm curious how you think about building political capital outside of the time when you need it. Well, you know, it's nice to say that you can do a favor for somebody else, right? We talk about in political terms, sort of having a chit or somebody owing you a chit, right? C-H-I-T. Um, but the best way to develop a you know, a set of chits you can call in is actually do a favor for somebody else. So I'm always interested in any time somebody will reach out to me or is looking for help to see what, what, I can, what I can offer them because I know that that means I'll have a, a mutual recipro reciprocity agreement, if you will, um, with that person. But it also means asking people for help, right? Typically, um, people like to be asked and we don't do a very good job of doing that. Um, I need consultation on what's the best way to provide support for students who are, um, you know, concerned at this point in time, whether they're going to have a career when they finish graduate school. Um, it's an important question and there are lots of people who have some good ideas about that, but I actually have to reach out and do the work of building that community. So, you know, when it's people, um, Paul, instead of, you remind me of your Peace Corps background when you talk about building the well before you need it. Um, you know, when it's people oriented, it's really a matter of working on establishing that network because you have some commonality of asking for their opinion and then collecting those, that resource and that input and then feeding that back to people, having some kind of a dialogue. It doesn't have to happen very often. I train my students that they need to continue to talk to their people every two months, probably for a six month period. Once you've done that for about six months and you don't have to talk to everybody or reach out more than sort of once every six months. But um, it's the reason social media works and blogs and newsletters and all of that. So, you know, most of us can be much more intentional about uh, the way in which we build our, our personal and our professional networks. Dora Mattis chimed in about uh, thinking about the idea of collaboration in his office and how it's been just a longstanding approach. Um, and the idea of decentralized management has helped people feel mutually supported and more resilient during the current crisis. That's a great really idea. Um, and Matt, could you comment on whether or not, was, is it the sense of not being isolated? Um, or is it a, um, more important to have the sense of, you know, the best minds are on any particular project um, in an organization that has an ethos of collaboration? What part of that actually do you think works in this kind of a crisis situation. And Matt, you're welcome to join us over the audio and video if you wish, or type it into the chat feature. Can you hear me? We can. Hey, Matt. We can. Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, I, so, so I guess what I was thinking there is just that we in our office, because we have this sort of decentralized model, model of management, that people have a better sense of buy-in uh, in terms of like the work and mission that we do. And the result of that now is that people are more willing to sort of take direction and, and sort of participate in um, being resilient and adapting to the current crisis with a sort of good humor and cheer 
uh, because they have this sort of long-standing sense of buy-in in our office and um, that's just help I think sort of de-stress and help people sort of um, adapt more readily than they might otherwise have been able to do. That's great and I think that key point on uh, adaptation is really important Matt. Um, it's a sense that adaptation is not threatening um, and can be supportive that's what I what I hear from your your conversation I think that's great. Dora, Matt's up in Minnesota and he just got a shout out from Texas. So I just want to let you know. Cool. That. Minnesota's Texas not so far out. from Wisconsin. Shout out to Texas as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, Dora, if we could jump to uh, question two. Um, and if you talked about question two in your group, feel free to join in the chat feature or if you want to be called on, give your, uh, raise your hand. Uh, what have you changed in your public role to pivot your focus on opportunities for an organization? Uh, what was surfacing part of your conversations? Yeah, I'm interested in anybody who's who's actually pivoted to focus on needs in the community, needs in the organization. Um, how much of that change could you do comfortably and sort of give up what you were doing sort of in the rote day to day job. Um, anybody have an example like that for us, Paul? Uh, they're not coming in quite yet. Uh, Steve did share an example, I think it was tied to do your first question around public safety and the exercise to enjoy trainings uh, prior to when an incident happens. That's a good example. One of the things I read in, that I thought was very interesting is that we, that the whole term of first responders and uh, public safety and first responders has come to us from the 9-11 crisis. The new terminology of uh, frontline uh, responders is is a concept that will come and stay with us from this uh, pandemic COVID crisis. Um, and so thinking about the roles that we're doing, particularly in a public agency, about whether we're in a front line or not, um, different than sort of what, who is an essential worker or not. But and that's one of the examples of sort of a public role reconceptualized or pivoted in terms of a different kind of focus for the organization. Dora, when I'm thinking about this question, I'm, I'm thinking about um, both how we respond as a university and um, how ASPA has responded as well, and thinking about how um, visible we were at the beginning and not having the answers. So doing that interplay between um, wanting to make sure people know that we're there and bringing continuity and stability to the leadership side, but also opening the door that we're learning about this together uh, with more information to come. And I'm wondering how that ties in with how you think about the idea of public roles. Uh, well, it, it's, it's key, Paul. You, that nexus of people want to be heard, right? They want to be validated. They want to know that you know who they are and know what their concern is. And we as humans don't expect each other to be perfect. And, you know, sometimes you'll see our leadership dig in their heels because they have to be right. Um, and the whole concept I think, of right and wrong goes out, out the window, but particularly when we have imbued our public organizations and our political context with the difference between right and wrong, doing it well, doing it poorly, um, that conceptualization is not useful in, in times of crisis. Uh, what is more useful is what you're talking about, Paul, is that the ability to hear others, adjust our mindset, and admit that we don't have all the answers, we didn't plan in advance, we may make mistakes, but we're trying. Because in essence, the humanness of us wants to see those people who are in um, places of public responsibility um, know what's happening and, and feel our pain and feel our, our successes. Carol joined in uh, talking about uh, the shift to online and seeing online as a way to uh, continue to bring educational content um, in that context. Um, seeing it happen in other capacities too, um, where it's certainly happening within the academic institutions. I also see it happening within organizational contexts as well. And sometimes it's around professional development, sometimes it's around policy issues or um, finding other ways to stay connected with each other. Well, and it's an excellent question, not just because it's close to my heart on online education, but the, the issue in the, in the never give up sort of keep going and, and adaptation that I talked about, the online part of just our daily lives, when we have seen restaurants move to um, 
online food delivery and online, you know, you order it online and they'll be standing at the curb to hand it to you, right? You've seen this entire switch to uh, technology adaptations across the board in all kinds of things we do. I suspect that not only in online education, where we make a distinction between the kind of program that I serve in, where we've been doing this, it's very robust, it's complex and built out, to the kind of remote education, which is the rapid fire change of courses that were in a classroom in the spring and then moved, you know, moved into a digital technology. But we see that same range across um, and I suspect we're going to see that in public services as well, right? If, if we're not going to be able to shop in stores the way we used to, or at least not for a, you know, a number of months or years, um, we actually, it's, it becomes very useful for those people who have the tools, and then we're going to have to talk about the digital divide, to actually use technology and online, whether it's ordering, delivering, picking up, um, but it's that that framework of being able to get an organization to change and to move, which you might not have been able to get leadership to think about. Um, so whether that's in online education or in restaurant food delivery, delivery services or in the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, the ability to utilize the technology, have more people uh, comfortable with it and then deliver services to people who need them outside of a traditional, you go in the store, pull a number and wait. Um, I think it certainly will have exacerbated that trend uh, for good or for bad, but it's an excellent example of what I was talking about earlier. Cool. Uh, one more comment that ties in with this question and then a couple others I think are more appropriate for question three. Um, Pat's talking about ability of roadmap for the future with input from stakeholders was a helpful leadership tool. Also the whole idea of co-creation. It's a great could, idea. Jump to question three, what new actions have you initiated or to revitalize and energize your teams, organization, or constituents. Um, a couple of comments, one from Barbara, talking about um, virtual teams to hear what staff are experiencing, um, and also sharing that you don't necessarily have the answers yet, um, and trying to be as transparent as you can be. And from John, uh, talking about this whole human dynamic side of it, and how frustrating a virtual can be, particularly when you're trying to empathize with others, because um, you only see part of them, I'm assuming, John, um, and really trying to figure out how do you um, become more empathetic within that space. Those are both good comments. I wonder if anybody wants to turn on their mic and, and um, talk a little bit more about those actions. What are the things I've seen? And Dora, if I can, uh, if you would, uh, yeah. raise your hand, and that way we'll have the visual prompt on our side. Sorry, Dora. Super. So... Um, hopefully somebody will raise their hand, Paul, and join us. Um, one of the things I've seen is a, a move to egalitarianism. The fact that we're all on Zoom or pick the conference called Technology of Your Choice um, has actually forced leadership, in my experience, to actually allow everybody to talk. Um, and for those to talk, to hold the floor um, so that transactionally you see a lot more people um, come to the forefront. The issue about empathy, I think it's fascinating. Has Pat had her hand up? Uh, Pat's hand just raised, yep. Pat? You can just unmute yourself or we can unmute it for you. Uh, can you hear me? Right. Okay. And, all right. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, building a roadmap for the future gives people kind of a sense of direction and then um, if that roadmap is approved by your elected officials and uh, approved by your your executive management then we're all kind of on the same page and uh, uh, communicating that effectively to all stakeholders is um, and then using your famous infographics Dr. Dora uh, the good communication tools to keep it simple but then folks just can, can gather all that energy um, and we can have agreement on where we're going. I think that's a perfect example. Um, one of the ways to mitigate our sense of fear and panic is to think positively about the future and have that uh, roadmap as you described it. Um, 
And there's all kinds of tools which will help you do that if you're not comfortable leading groups or haven't been through that. So again, on the digital tools, I put a link in here about mind mapping, um, but there's all kinds of easy tools that you can Google on the internet and find which will help you build those kind of roadmaps or at least articulate the things you're thinking about, but that's a perfect process. Thank you, Pat. I think your uh, description of the roadmap ties into the last question. Uh, potentially, what gap has been exposed and who might help move forward? I think there was a hand up. Steve had a hand up. Um, You're perfect, Steve. Yes. Um, I think in terms of the, uh, the empathy, uh, one of the things that has uh, in some ways uh, made the response to COVID-19 more difficult is that uh, some of the ways leaders have expressed themselves uh, has been has been hurtful to a lot of people. When you tell people that they're jobs, uh, but they feel those jobs are essential because they have to feed their family, it really does reflect a, a, a lack of uh, appreciation for how uh, the government response is uh, affecting people's lives. And so leaders have to be much more careful uh, in the way they communicate uh, the way they want to, to manage the crisis. I think that's, an, you know, it's an excellent decision and we don't see a lot of, hopefully we're learning from bad examples. Um, but, you know, first line, uh, First line is different than essential, non-essential. That's an excellent point. Um, and I know because this particular crisis, first of all, it, there's a lot of uncertainty about who's hurt, both on the, you know, the first is the pandemic, the second is the economic crisis. And because those are typical, typical constituencies, which are having more trouble than not, and we don't message to them very well to begin with, um, I think Steve's point is super well taken. Um, and often when we're trying to message, we don't think about how that message is heard by other, other organizations. And it really goes to the first point I made. And in the poll that we took, um, it, nobody answered the question that they get their sense of the canary in the coal mine from hearing from underemployed, um, homeless, uh, elderly, disabled groups. And when we're not listening to those groups specifically, um, it often will cause this problem at the end um, on the empathy and the messaging issue, and not only the messaging, but where our focus is going for solving problems. Laura, I want to be mindful of time, and I appreciate you wanting to stick on uh, for a little bit after uh, we formally get done. It's now two o'clock, and I know people typically have to dash off to other meetings. Um, you're welcome to stay on. We generally continue the conversation after the official recording is over. But Dora, I just really want to thank you for joining us in these conversations. Um, the way that we've been thinking about the series is talking about this leadership skill of resiliency and recognize that while time is certainly unusual right now when we're talking about the impact of COVID-19, it's not unusual in the sense that we've experienced other types of major shifts, major changes within our lives, within our communities that we had to address, and maybe not the international scale that we're facing right now, but change happens on a regular basis. Um, and then the more that we can think about resiliency through different lenses, including the political lens today, the stronger we become as leaders. So thank you, Dora, for uh, leading this conversation with us and giving us those little four key points to keep in consideration as we continue to go forward. Dora, I know that you're uh, the lead on our online MPA program, and you'll recognize that um, I mentioned Minnesota and Texas are on this call. Um, certainly, we're uh, think about it uh, globally. I know we have some international people as well joining us today. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, if you're interested more in an online MPA, um, reach out to either myself or Dora, and we'd have, be happy to share our experiences with um, our current programs. But thank all of you for joining us. And Dora, if you're receptive to a, a few more questions and conversation. I'd be happy to, Paul. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate everyone. appreciate your time.